Welcome and oh. welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Illinois State Senator Laura Elman, and I serve in District 21, which covers Naperville, Wheaton, Warrenville, Carroll Stream, Lyle, and all of Winfield and West Chicago. Um, I'm thrilled to be here uh, with this lovely panel, including Jan Representative Janet Yang Rohr. Hi there, I am Janet Yang Rohr. I am the representative in the 41st district representing Naperville and Warrenville. I am also so thrilled to be here today. We have like, we have a very exciting panel. Yeah, I'm excited. So March is Women's History Month and I can't think of a better way to celebrate than speaking with women veterans from our own community, from right here in District 21, who have played a firsthand part in shattering those glass ceilings for an entire generation of women and girls. We're fortunate tonight to be jo joined by two such pioneering women and constituents. First, um, let me introduce uh, our first guest, uh, retired Master Sergeant Ginny Narset. She co-founded Operation Her Story. Uh, it's an organization to serve women veterans and to highlight their often forgotten contributions. Uh, we also, thank you, Ginny, welcome. Thank you. We also have retired Army Specialist, Lisa Mattingly. She joined Ginny for Operation Her Story's inaugural All Women's Veterans Flight on October 6, 2021. Lisa and Ginny, again, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Thank you for having us here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I'd like to start just hearing about a little bit about Operation Her Story, and then we'll get into some more details. Ginny, how did you get the idea for Operation Her Story? It was, it just kind of came to me. Uh, basically what happened is I'm with the Naperville Daughters of the American Revolution, and I was given an assignment as the chair of the Veterans Committee, asking me to look into honor flight. So I did, and I realized there were no women on these flights, maybe one out of every five flights. So I'd start doing a little bit of research with other states, and I'm trying to find out why there's no women on these flights. So I went to Honor Flight, and I talked to them a little bit, and I said, well, we don't normally do that, but they'd think about it. So I went back, and I told our region, I said, there's no women on these flights. We got to do something about this, and that's how it all started. And uh, I continued on with a, a group of, of ladies and a group of veterans and anyone who was interested in, the, in women veterans, they were on my team. So that's how it all started. Wow, wow, that's awesome. So how long did it take from the time you made that realization, hey, there are no women here, to the time that the flight actually happened? Well, given that there was one year that we lost because of COVID, Right. By, I started this in June of 2019, I believe it was, was it 20? Well, I started in 2020 and I um, continued on through maybe February and that's when Honor Flight came on to okay. be part of it. Our flight was supposed to take off in October of 2020 and it didn't take off. So actually I started 2019. And um, during this time, I, I learned how to fundraise. I've never fundraised before. And we managed to get our team, managed to get $170,000. Uh, but Honor Flight did tell me, if you want to do this, you have to get the money into women. And I said, not a problem. And we did. <laughs> our whole team did. That's how it yeah. all started. That's great. And then, and you found women, including Lisa. Uh, Lisa. How did you learn about the flight? I, I was one of the last people that um, um, got on the flight, believe it or not. A friend of mine told me about it and somebody else couldn't go, so I got to go. And it was the most wonderful experience I've ever had because when I got out of the military, you didn't really even say you were in the military. You know, it was kind of like um, women were, didn't talk about their service. Lisa, I'd, I'd, I'd love to learn more about your service, actually, um, because, you know, just 
be, because of what you said, because maybe you, you haven't been able to tell that story enough. Um, so as I understand, you, you served in the Army Military Police from um, 74 to 77, and, and you spent time in Germany. Can I, can I ask what called you to serve? What, what called me to serve was my dad was in the Air Force, retired. He was in World War II first. So I had a military background and I just had completed high school and I was working at a fast food restaurant and I decided I wanted to see the world. So I joined the army. <laughs> and, and what was it like serving um, in the military police in the 1970s? Well, women have a hard time no matter where they were, but I had lots and lots of good experiences and met a lot of really fine people in the military, you know, so I had a, a really good service. I only spent like, I think, three days in the field, you know, so was I did mostly really mili regular military police work and then maneuver damage for reforger. So that's what I did. Uh, can you can you help me? What is what is um, what, what is reforgers like? I uh, yeah. what, what are those terms? <laughs> Re, reforger is like a war game where they they get people from the whole NATO and they all practice and they go out and run their tanks through farmers' fields and and you know and make a, a big mess. So then you have to go out and and write down what the damage was and and all that so that the, the German people get repaid for the damage. Wow, and tanks in farmer's fields. I think I've seen that in the news recently. I, I covered one where this tank broke loose from a tank retriever and rolled right into a house. So, oh my God. Yeah, so I have a picture of that. I should have sent it to you, but um, <laughs> yeah, the, a lot of things happen w during the war games. Yeah, wow. Uh, so Jenny, I wanted to hear too from you. Uh, you served in the Air Force. My husband actually served in the Air National Guard. So the oh, Air Force kind of holds a special place in my heart. Um, but it sounds, I read a little bit and you served both in um, active duty and reserves. Who Correct. called you to serve? And when did you serve? What was your time period? <laughs> I'll answer the last question first. I went in 1973 to 1978, and that was the active duty. I went in because I was going to college at the time, and I was living in a mobile home. And I, it was, I had a roommate, and it burnt down. So we're like, now what do we do? So Mary joined the Air Force, and I joined about, well, I had to wait till I was 21 because my parents went and signed for me. Women had to be 21 at the time. To, if they wanted to go on their own. So on my 21st birthday, instead of going out and getting drinking, I raised my hand and was in the military within two weeks. So, but I, I wanted an education and I really couldn't afford it. It was very expensive and, you know, on a waitress pay. So that's kind of how it happened was, and I loved it. It was, it was the best decision in my life. I agree, it was the best of mine. <laughs> really, that is wonderful because when I, when I think back, so um, I graduated high school in the eighties, um, but I worked in manufacturing and I worked with women from, you know, from your age who had worked in manufacturing and, you know, in male dominated fields um, at that time. And, uh, you know, I, I heard some stories. It sounds like there were so many barriers and, um, you know, obstacles that uh, it, I, I just see it, the stories I hear, I just think, oh, it must have been so hard. So when you say that it was one of the best times in your life, I'm just kind of uh, inspired. Do you have any um, particular, what, what made it so good? Why do you look back on it uh, so warmly? I think I look back on it on the wonderful people I met and the knowledge I gained. And, um, you know, I was very shy and very, it was amazing. I, I had a wide awakening joining the military, grew up really fast. And it was in a safe pla place really for me. And um, the people were really pretty good. I mean, there are bad experiences, but you can't dwell on them. You just gotta, um, you know, take it is it their problem not mine 
Well, I right. had to be I had to be patient. Um, I went in because I wanted to be a journalist. That's what I was going to college for. I was to prefer journalism. But the only jobs that they offered for women were mostly desk jobs. You know, the men did all the other work, but uh, we were medical or I was an administrative assistant my first when I was active and I didn't become a public affairs until I actually left uh, active duty and went into the reserve program. So there's so many career opportunities. And if you get in there and you do one thing, you can easily change. You know, if you have a good record and you want to have passion somewhere else, you can easily change. So it's the career opportunities that the military offers, offers you. Can I ask, um, being a woman, did that affect the roles that you could take or the, the tasks that you were assigned? The um, reason I joined the Army was because they were the only ones that would accept um, women as MPs at that time. The Air Force or the rest of them would not. They were the first to accept um, you under that job. Right. We didn't have uh, police in the, in the Air Force in 73, when women police in 73, 74. Interesting. So, uh, you know, you just talked too about you know the the opportunities that are available. You could do whatever you want. Did did your service then the service that you had that period? Did that impact you know after what did you do afterwards? Was it a springboard? What was what happened after your service ended? Well, I can, uh, it, it really, what I really liked about it really helped my career because I ended up working for the Environmental Protection Agency and I was a public affairs with them. And I used all my skills and brought my military skills to the private sector or the other public sector. And that's what people have to realize is what we learn in the military, our leadership and our organizational skills and our strength is what we bring to the workforce. and. I never had a problem getting a job. In fact, to this day, I get offers and I don't want to work. <laughs> so, but that's how that works is you can use those skills. You just have to figure out how to write a resume so civilians can understand what you did. Right, not too many acronyms. <laughs> how about you, Lisa? Well, um, I didn't stay in police work. I think the being the MP in the Army taught me I didn't want to really do that. So I ended up getting a job at the post office, which is another male dominated um, organization. And they have a lot of organizational problems there. So it was a long time before I retired. And I was happy I retired. <laughs> Can I ask um, just maybe a little for your perspective, it, it seems like the way uh, the military has been viewed over time has, has changed. What, what, what has that, that change been like for you? The, ch the change is really hard. Like my dad was World War II and he was a highly decorated soldier. And when he passed, you couldn't get anybody to even play taps at his funeral. And he passed in 1995, I think. And um, it has changed so much, but now it's swinging back the other way, I think. I think it goes in cycles where the, um, the community supports and then then it doesn't. And now that we're losing all the people in our legions and VFWs who used to cross the gap and do the ceremonies for all these people dying, we don't have them anymore because they can't even hardly hold up a flag. Most of them are so old. So um, as far as community goes, we need to really get more people interested in um, having um, better services for um, people that served our country. I think some of the changes are making women uh, making women visible. Uh, most of the time, uh, we're out there now. We're commanders of the. I was a commander of the American Legion. We got the first honor flight. Um, women are asked now to be on a lot of the speaking circuits, and that's what we're trying to do now: is let them know what our role is. And we're still involved. And in, in my role right now is to have this list of women that have served. And if you want somebody to come and talk to your organization just let me know and I'll reach out, and try to find them. 
it was really difficult finding the women to get on this flight. I mean, it took a lot of work. It wasn't done overnight. So I think the change is, is people are aware that women that served in the military have a purpose. Yeah, you know, so my husband is a, a vet, you know, with Air National Guard. And uh, he one, one thing that I've noticed is that he stays connected with particularly the people in his unit. Um, but he also stays connected with that wider vet community. And I wonder if it has anything to do um, because he's, he's a man and, uh, you know, there it might be a wider community for male vets. Um, what is the female veterans community like? Is it, is it easy to plug into the general veterans uh, community? Are there actual places where women can get together and, uh, and support each other? I can answer that one. Uh, it's very difficult. There are 7,000 women in the state of Illinois from the three wars from Vietnam, Korea, and World War II. There's 49,000 veteran women in the state of Illinois alone. It's really hard to find them. Um, I think there's almost a million men. There's quite a few, but so there is a definite um, ratio there. Um, but, you, you know, I, I really believe that um, what women need to do more is they need to be, like I said, make themselves visible, go out and volunteer, join the VFW, the VFW's American Legion were never really designed for women. And the men would say, go to the auxiliary. Well, we didn't want to do the auxiliary thing because we we served. We should be part of those organizations. That's all changed. In fact, just last week, Naperville, a um, person who's in charge of the Legion riders, asked me if I had a motorcycle and if I'd like to join them. <laughs> and I just said, I, I'll, I'll get on the back of one, but I won't. <laughs> Not in my age. It's still, a, I think it still is very hard to feel part of the Legion that I belong to. There's a lot of comments made and I think there's only two women in the whole organization there amongst a couple hundred men. And, and there's times when um, you don't feel like you fit in. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're there breaking those barriers and making it easier for those that have served after you to, to join and, and I, I'm sure feel welcome too. That, that's the only way reason I stay and deal with um, the problems that happen because I figure I got to make a difference for myself and other women. And um, I, by you can't correct anybody else. They can only correct themselves. So. That's great. And if you're there, it will attract more. So then that's how, you know, you'll have allies and make greater changes. It's, um, it's still the good old boys network, but we're working on it. I mean, it was always that way. For instance, I'll give you a story. When I was active duty, um, uh, we lived in the dorm, the women had their own dorm or barracks, whatever you want to call them. Four of us went to the NCO club. We wanted to uh, meet this band that was playing that night. One of the girls, it was a relative of hers. So we all went. Well, we got in there and we each got a Coke, I think seven up or whatever. They were all soft drinks. We were kicked out of the club because they wanted us drinking. <laughs> we're like, what? None of us drank alcohol, but we are, they said, you're gonna have to leave. So it's like, wow. but. We took care of it. All we did was tell our first sergeant and they made sure that didn't happen again. So, but there's always things that we had to be first in. That's right. And continue to be first, even today, you know, but having that, you know, recognizing each other and, you know, having that network, I'm sure it has certainly got to help. And that's, you know, I have to give it to both of you to, to help, you know, pull those threats, weave those threads so it makes it, it makes us all stronger the only way change is made is to be there and try and, and work at it in a very good way you know you can't make it if you don't go <laughs> and speaking of that i think this is a great segue of 
the the her story flight um where a lot of people got up to go so um i believe we've got some pictures from service and operation there it is um, we also have some stories from two other constituents who joined the flight in october All right, well, we're going to look at the um, the slides and we wanted our panel to come to life and we wanted to be able to add some photos so that you could experience the honor flight with our panel members. We also have two additional women who were on the flight uh, that were from our district but could not be here with us today. So we'd like to share their stories as well. You've already met Ginny and Lisa, but we wanted you to have an opportunity to see pictures of them on their uh, Operation Her Story honor flight from Chicago. Honoring uh, Master Sergeant Ginny Narset, we wanted to be sure to highlight that she served in the active duty for five years and then was in the reserves for 26 years. We're thrilled that you're with us today, Ginny, and to share your story. And on behalf of our offices, we want to thank you for your sacrifices and services that you've provided our country. Also with us today is uh, Specialist Lisa Matling who served for three years in the US Army. We wanna let you know that we're thrilled that you felt so cared for on your honor flight and that we wanna thank you for your sacrifice and service to our country as well. Staff Sergeant Kay Kinley Akins served in the United States Air Force and later was served uh, as a senior master sergeant in the Illinois Air National Guard. Senior Master Sergeant Kinley Atkins uh, explained that after four years, I got out of the active duty in the Air Force as an E-5. I was out for a little over a year and really missed the military. So I enlisted in Illinois Air National Guard and retired as an E-8. We asked, uh, we asked Kay why she joined and she replied, the Vietnam War was going on and I had a cousin severely injured after stepping on a landmine. Back then, recruiters came to the high school cafeteria during lunch, and after talking to the Air Force recruiter, I felt the pull to enlist. When I enlisted, they actually took modeling poses of the female recruits, at least the Air Force did, she said. She shared how she uh, how their careers were picked for them and that they, continue, uh, they continued by saying, of course, back then, only nurses were sent to Vietnam. We were not trained to shoot a gun. This is still uh, another quote from Kay. She wanted to. Sh uh, she went on to share that thank God times have changed. Thanks to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, women can now also be a soldier and a mom. When I went, when I went in, you had to choose one or the other. Although things have changed since uh, Senior Master Sergeant a a Aikens served, we can never forget the strides that these women made to, to paving the way for all women to serve in the military across our country and these women that live right here in our district. Kay shared, I was stationed in San Antonio, Texas twice and also served in Taiwan while on active duty. My guard time was spent at the National Guard base at O'Hare Airport. This is our last picture of uh, Kay. She uh, shared that her most memorable experiences were seeing the world and making really good friends. She uh, was activated in the guard for the Desert Storm and served in Spain prior to Desert Storm. We're so honored that you shared your story with us and that your flight was so memorable. Thank you, Kay, for your sacrifices and services to our country. We also wanted to share Captain Betsy Valentine Ludwig served for two years in the United States Air Force Nurse Corps. Nurse Corps. She served in the obstetrics unit in Great Falls, Montana, and with the surgical and air evacuation units at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippine Islands. When we spoke with Captain Ludwig, she said being away from home was difficult, especially around the holidays, but we were all away from home together. And somehow each one of us, patients, staff, and our fellow servicemen and women became family to one another. Betsy wanted to share that she met her husband to, to be while stationed overseas. 
When I was discharged from the Air Force, several of my military co-workers and staff flew to New York to be in my wedding. I was indeed so proud to introduce them to my family and friends at my wedding. Similar to what we're hearing from our panelists, it was definitely family. Uh-oh, my screen is not advancing. Hold on just a second. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, it's clear to hear from her experience that people you serve with become family through their experiences that they shared while in their service. Betsy was asked about the operation, her story experience, and she shared, being greeted by hundreds of people at both airports literally took my breath away. Perhaps no one could tell, but my mask was thankfully absorbing the moisture that was coming from my eyes. Tears of joy, tears of deep pride. We are honored that you shared your story with us today and want to thank uh, Betsy and all of our participants for their service in our country. Highlighting these stories for Women's History Month with local women who served is hopefully another way you can see how much we appreciate each and every one of you. Now let's get back to the interview to hear more about the flight. I, I love those those pictures and that presentation and, and just seeing everyone and, and just like the, that flashback to everyone's service. Um, can, can I ask for, for both of you, what was that day like? And, and you know, what what is an honor flight for, for those who, who may not know? Um, I can start out by saying it's, it's actually, um, it was a great day. I mean, there was, there was a lot of work that went into this. And when I saw all the women on the flight, so happy, I really felt like the work, it, it worked. You know, we did it, my team did it. And Operation Her Story was, was the name of the flight. Um, of course, Honor Flight likes to think it was Honor Flight, but it was, really, <laughs> it was really us that did all the work and put it together. But the, you could tell that the women bonded like I've never seen them before. And they were, everybody was like, like chatting and getting to know each other. And, and when we served in the military, we didn't go off with our unit like they do today. We were, I know that when I traveled, I pretty much traveled alone and I always met new people. But, you know, my work was, okay, they need this administrative, administrative assistance, such and such place, that's where they'd send me. But I never went with my unit. So the bonding was there and that's all you had was the women. And I think most of them felt that. And I didn't expect it. I did not expect that. I said, okay, we're gonna go visit memorials. But what really made that trip was the, the women bonding. Lisa, what, what was that day like for you? It was just remarkable. I never felt so appreciated in my whole life. It was really just a wonderful, wonderful day. And I still am friends with the, um, I don't know, they give you a helper to make sure you don't get lost and stuff. And we're still friends on Facebook and talk. and. The bonding is there between us because we just both really seem to care about each other, which is really nice. And to have so many people care about us. When I got out of the military, they wouldn't even let you wear your uniform home because they're afraid you are get mugged to go into this and, and being so appreciated. It, it was wonderful. One of the things we did uh, before the flight, we had a pre-party. And that was at the Naperville VFW. And so a lot of the women, this has only been done once in the whole state of Illinois for honor flight. But we had a pre-party and they all, a lot of them got to meet each other and we bought hats for everyone. So it was, it was really a lot of fun. So when they got on the flight, they looked up their buddy that they met at the pre-party. <laughs> that is awesome. So we're just really quick, we're uh, family members part of it too? I mean, did they go to the pre-party? Were they there at the airport? What was it like um, for veterans if they had uh, family? Could they take part in it as well? I mean, to cheer people on? For the pre-party? Sure. Um, I know that uh, when we took off, when we came home, they limited, because of COVID, they limited people that could be at the airport. Each person was only allowed to bring four people. But I don't think anyone paid attention to it. 
<laughs> I showed up. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm just imagining. So um, how did it feel? So it was just Illinois. You know, you talked a little bit about being able to connect, but to be able to connect from people from a, women from across the state, how did that feel? He said it, it was really yeah. wonderful to meet all of them. And a lot of them were laughing at me because I had a smiley face mask on. Um, because when I was in the military, the drill sergeant always tell me to wipe my smile off my face. So then I, I had a smiley face. It was Winnie the Pooh. So, you know, I had fun with that. A lot of people liked it. And it, it was just really a good time. The, uh, on the way back, they had what they call mail call, and they gave us all packets of letters from, some of them from, were from your family, some of them were just from the community. And that was just amazing to look at all that stuff and all those stories and all those people that took time to write that stuff. And, and Lisa, I think you were talking about this. I, I think each veteran had a, a guardian. Is that the buddy you were talking about? Okay, um, so do you, so what was their role and, and you know, how, how was that experience? Lisa, you're muted. She, I can talk, oh, here you go. She was retired from the um, Navy, and um, so we talked about each other's experiences, and we just had a really good time, you know, really good time. Did they actually go on the flight also? Were, were they buddies, guardians for the, from, a, from point A to point B? They they um, couldn't they couldn't fit them all on the flight. So some of us some of them were from Washington and met us there. So like the guardians in um, Illinois might have had two or three of us, and then they dropped us off with the other guardians in Washington and met them. So it was like um, kind of fun finding them and everything. <laughs> Their most important job was to make sure you didn't wander off. <laughs> That's what they were told, and push our wheelchairs, which. A lot of people didn't like that part. We, everyone had to have a wheelchair. So I think it was to keep us <laughs> from wandering off. <laughs> so it's been, um, it's been a few months since the flight at this point, right? Um, how, how have you been able to, to share your stories um, and, and share the, the stories of, of other female veterans? Well, I can tell you, I've been on, um, get asked all the time. I get at least probably one media call a week, uh, podcasts. People want to know about this because it's something new. I get calls from around the country asking if I would go into their state and do the same thing. Uh, Florida's got an all-female flight in May. They're staying the night. So they're, they're asking for advice from me on what lessons learned and best practices. Um, we're going to be, any woman veteran is going to be um, part of the Beverly, it's Beverly community down by Evergreen Park. Um, we've been asked to be the grand marshal of their par parade on Memorial Day. So we'll be doing that. I had to decide between Naperville or, but I, I told them yes first, so I'm not gonna, change my mind. I'll go with Beverly, but we're trying to oh, get no. a lot of women. Maybe next what, year. Maybe next right, year. That's what we're <laughs> trying to do is get women out there. And um, and I know that there's a lot of things coming up. Uh, two things. Um, we are now the charity of choice for the children of the American Revolution. They've chose us for that. Um, let's see what else. There's, there's a couple more talks that I'm going to be giving in the next couple months. So we're getting the message out and I'm not the only one. All the, a lot of women are doing it, but they're saying, hey, can I use Operation Her Story? Yes, as long as you wear your t-shirt, which is what we have. <laughs> so, but it's, I didn't expect this. I just wanted it to be over after the flight because it was so much work. And now 
for some reason, it's just gonna continue on. So we're trying to figure out where we're headed from here. Yeah, and have, do you know, have any of the, uh, the women stayed connected with each other? Yes, they are staying connected. We made sure that everyone got addresses, phone numbers, contact information. Uh, I went to Betty Horstrom's, she just turned 100. I went to her birthday party. So we had a lot of fun there. Um, some of the, I only knew about three or four of the women's, but we keep in touch. But yeah, a lot of them are, some of them were only blocks from each other and they keep in touch. They didn't even know they lived on the yeah. same block with a couple of them. Another one is, um, well, Carol, she's the one that arranged the, the uh, grand marshal thing. So, um, I mean, what it is, we're, we're basically a group of women that want to be out there. We want to give our speaking opportunities. Yeah. And um, I, when I was the chief of staff of the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs, never saw women there. And I'm working with, the, you know, working with different folks to work with them to make sure that they get recognized, that the women are part of their team. So. Excellent. So and if a, if somebody out there wants to support Operation Her Story or who knows somebody who might be interested in, in what you're going to be doing next, how can they connect with the Operation Her Story? Uh, there's a website called operationherstory.org or yeah, .org versus .com, .org. <laughs> and uh, we left it up and my name and my cell phone number is on there. So they can directly call me. So we had a, another 800 number, but it was never been, never used. No one called, they just called me. So I let it go. So it's okay though, I don't get that many calls. <laughs> okay. But they can go to operationherstory.org and find all the information that you need. And if they need women to speak, I can, I'd be more than happy to help them. Excellent. I saw your um, Instagram posts too. I thought those were cute. Some of those videos were great. Oh, thank you. It looks like we we do have a question from from someone who's uh, from from one of our viewers. So they say, "I'm I'm glad that the flight proceeded c considering COVID. Were there any things that you weren't allowed to do, or that did did COVID? How, how did COVID impact your plans and what you were and weren't allowed to do uh, with with the flight? Um, as far as COVID, uh, that was we we I made sure that that was up to the honor flight to let them call that, you know, that was their rules uh, because I didn't know. And so they wanted to make sure that everyone had their shots. Everyone, if you didn't have your shots, you didn't get on the flight. We all wore masks. They really took a lot of protective measures to make sure that, because we're most of the women were elderly, a lot of, a lot of women in their eighties and nineties. Of course, the oldest was 104. And uh, yeah, yeah, so, but they really took, precautionary major measures to make sure we were okay. And that's why it took a year before we got on the flight. We were supposed to go in October, 2020 and it ended up being October, 2021. So they were really good about that. So um, what needs, so you've talked about you were uh, with Veterans Affairs. So you've got kind of a, a a great perspective. What needs do you see for female veterans? That's a good question. Um, I think they not only being made visible, but they need to be in senior positions. Um, they need their, if there's an advisory committee, we need to know what it's all about. What opportunities out there for women veterans? Um, maybe a convention once a year like Ohio does that. Ohio has a really good women's program. And I went to that. That's how I found out about how to work the honor flight. I went to one of their uh, conventions or conferences, I guess is what it, what it really was. And I met the person who ran the first honor flight and that was out of Ohio. And I'm from there originally. So that's where I got a lot of information. And they're gonna have another uh, conference coming up this year and there's gonna be 500 women so far that's gonna attend that for the state of Ohio. 
Illinois needs to have that. They need to bring up the benefits and what what good can be, what can we do for our female veterans? That's another question, uh, another question from, from viewers. Uh, I, I think you mentioned that there's a flight that's coming out of Florida and others are calling you about, about arranging flights in, in their states. Will there be another one coming out of Illinois? Actually, what I'm doing is I am hoping that there, there won't be another flight, but there might be other trips, other places. What I'm trying to do is arrange for or advocate uh, that on a flight, instead of taking one female on every five flights, to take 20 per flight, make it a 20, 80 percentage. Uh, and it's the same thing with African-Americans. There's not a lot of African-Americans that get on these flights either. So they need to reevaluate how they're going to do their outreach. And that's what I would prefer seeing is to mix the men and women up. They fight together. They should be able to get on a flight together. <clears throat> Great perspective. So some final thoughts. We're actually getting close to time here. Um, Lisa, and then I'll ask you, Ginny, too. What would you like the community to know about your time in the service? And then, or what kind of advice would you give to women who are considering joining the service right now? I think I would give them advice to go for it. And, um, but um, as far as the community, I think our communities need a lot of help as it is, period. And to, um, you know, with all peoples, but especially veterans, because they have such trouble reacclimating themselves to civilian life. And people need to befriend them and really be aware of different um, ways they can help them and, um, and all that. But, um, you know, different places are doing different um, things. Like we have at the Legion, a, 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 a something going on on the 21st of next month that's called, um, it's to help veterans or, or people understand um, suicide among um, veterans. It's called SAVE. And um, we're having that program at um, the American Legion Post 76 in, um, in Carroll Stream. And, and I think community gets, needs to get more involved, just not with veterans, but with their whole community. Well, I go back to the community needs to ask the women to be part of, of um, their team, get their perspective. And the women that join, I think they should persevere, like it, stick with it, you know, and learn from it and then move on to something else. See, my time in the military, I outlasted so many other women that um, left for one reason or another that, um, you know, I, and that's exactly what I did. I learned from those experiences. Right. Well, one thing that I learned was, as I said, uh, I've never fundraised before because we don't do that in the military. <laughs> so, but I use my military experience to how to work with people and how to negotiate. And I'm just so grateful. I mean, uh, Colonel Jennifer Pritzker from the Pritzker Foundation, I wrote a grant, she gave us $100,000. And I talked to the VFW and American Legion, and I was just like putting my hand out there because, you know, we need money. And <laughs> people started giving me money. I've never done that before. So you learn something. You learn something about how, because it was a very popular thing. People wanted to do this, but we couldn't do it without money ourselves. So that's, you know, you, you take what you've learned in the military and you figure out how to use those skills on something else. See, I didn't realize that the honor flight wasn't supported by um, honor flight. I never knew that because I do the fun rises for honor flight every year they've had them uh, in DuPage County. So um, I don't know. You can give it to us. <laughs> I'll take it. We're gonna do more trips. That is just wonderful. You know, um, the, the discipline that the military has teaches people allows, it seems to have allowed both of you to be creative and to learn and continue to learn throughout life. I think that's, that is just 
Fantastic. That's a great lesson that I'm taking from you. Um, thank you both for sharing your stories and uh, thank you for your service, you know, most thank of you. all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you both thank for just being part of this. Oh, this is where you know, it starts. That's right. And so I do want to follow up with you um, after this about some of your ideas, actually. But uh, that's another day. Um, I <laughs> want to thank you both. And I want to thank everybody who has taken the time to join us this evening. Um, if you've got any questions about tonight's presentation or Operation Her Story or any of the services that either of our staffs offer, please contact contact us. I can't speak. My email is info at senatorlauraelman.com or call our district office at 630-601-9961. And my esteemed colleague, Janet, we are a great team. We are here for, for you, for veterans, for constituents. Janet. Thank you so much. Ginny and, and Lisa, thank you for spending this evening with us. It was it was really fascinating to learn. Um, it was it was really inspiring to to hear your stories. And and I know we all we we deeply appreciate your your taking the time to to be with us uh, and and for your service. Um, we will make sure to when when we post this video uh, to in the comments just just add some of those those um, websites those resources so people know how to contact you how to support you in the future um, and uh, again uh, if you, if you need anything from from our offices please let us know uh, Senator Elvin and I are so fortunate to be able to share an office and so you you get two for the price of one. <laughs> um, Great. If you ever need anything, uh, and and for those watching, um, if we can pass any uh, any of these resources along to you too, uh, my office's email is info at repyangroar.com, and um, our our phone number is six three zero two nine six four one five seven. Please always feel free to to contact us, and um, we would always love to be of service to you. Thank you. Thank you again.